Hi friends, it's your girl Duchess Charm and welcome back to my channel and if you're new here, welcome to my channel. If this is the first time seeing my face or knowing of my existence, please feel free to stick around and click that subscribe button. Happy Monday, I hope you guys Monday is going good and I wish that you have a wonderful rest of the week. It is Crime and Conviction Day and if you do not know what that is, it is a series on my channel that I speak about Jamaican true crime. Last week I spoke about the Green Bay Massacre and if you did not see that one you can check it out and my other videos under the crime and conviction playlist this week we're going to speak about the first ever and i believe the only cricketer in the history of the sport to ever get hanged his name is leslie hilton let's jump right in Leslie George Hilton was born on March 29, 1905. He was raised in the lower class society and had a less than ideal childhood. Unfortunately, Leslie did not know his father and his mother died when he was just three years old. His mother's sister was there to take care of him but met an untimely end when Leslie was barely a teenager. His education was incomplete because of his aunt's death. He had to leave school to find a job to take care of himself. He first became an apprentice in a tailor shop. Apparently he made little to no progress in this field and took up a variety of unskilled jobs before becoming a dock worker where he assisted loading and offloading ships. Despite the difficulties of his childhood, he gained admirable skill and a local reputation as a cricketer. It is unclear when exactly Leslie took up the sport, but cricket has always been a local staple amongst Caribbean children despite social status or class. Leslie was talented. He was strong and athletic. He developed as an all-rounder, meaning he could play as a batsman or a bowler. At 21 years of age, Leslie was given the chance to play on the Jamaican cricket team at a match against England that was held on February 19th, 1927 at Sabina Park. The next day at Melbourne Park, he made his mark as a bowler, securing his spot on the official Jamaican cricket team. The following year, he traveled to Barbados, but he was not chosen to be a part of the touring party mainly because of inter-Caribbean rivalry and also because of colorism. During the following years, Leslie's opportunities to shine were very limited and he was overlooked multiple times for international teams. The years 1934 to 1939 were most fruitful. He continued to play in Jamaica, on the Caribbean islands and in England. The England tour of 1939 was his final tour because when he got to Jamaica, he announced his retirement. I don't know much about cricket, but I will be leaving a link in my description box to his career statistics. His status as an international cricketer got him a far better paying job than the one on the dock. He now worked for the Rehabilitation Department of the Jamaica Civil Service. In 1940, he met and began courting the daughter of a police inspector, Laureline Rose. In the climate that Jamaica was in at that time, and due to Leslie's background, he ranked below Laureline in terms of education and social standing. Despite his cricket fame, Laureline's parents disapproved of the relationship, but they got married in 1942 regardless. The marriage seemed happy, and five years later, they had a son. Even though Laureline was now a wife and a mother, she never lost sight of her dream of becoming a fashion designer. She would spend lengthy periods away from her home and family, training in New York fashion schools. To make the situation easier, the couple moved into the Rose's home in 1951, so that Laureline's mother could take care of the baby. Leslie's relationship with his mother-in-law was uneasy and by this time his father-in-law died. Nevertheless, the arrangement seemed to work. On April 17, 1954, Leslie received an unsigned letter from New York saying that his wife was involved in an extramarital affair with a known womanizer, Roy Francis. 
obviously upset by this news, Leslie sent a telegram to his wife demanding that he return home. She replied with, don't worry, all will be well, love from your wife, and then booked her flight. One day before his wife's arrival to the island, Leslie purchased revolver cartridges. His explanation for this was that he kept the gun for security purposes and there was a series of breakings in the community and his ammunition supplies was running low. On May 2nd, Lorlaine returned to Jamaica and was picked up from the airport by her husband. When questioned about the affair, she denied it and claimed that Roy was just a casual acquaintance. After an initially tense reunion, Leslie accepted her word and the couple reconciled. Even though it seemed like everything was back to normal, Leslie was still suspicious. After all, why would someone randomly send a letter like that containing those accusations? On May 5th, Leslie learned that his wife had written a letter to New York and given it to the gardener to take to the post office. Believing that this was the evidence that he needed, Leslie rushed to the post office demanding to see the letter but was informed by the postmaster that this would be impossible. The next morning, May 6th, Leslie confronted his wife about this letter saying that he knew for a fact that this was written for Roy in New York. Leslie claimed that his wife admitted to the affair, taunted him and belittled him. She said that she should have taken her parents' advice as it relates to Leslie. She continued by saying, I found the man that I love. You cannot stand in my way. I found joy that you have never shown me. I want to bear his children. Yes, I've slept with him. I've never felt that way before. My body belongs to him. I am Roy's. Then she grabbed the gun that was stored in the bedroom, attempted to shoot him, but misfired. A struggle for the gun followed. Leslie said during all this, all he could see was his wife and her lover. He suddenly saw blood all over and realized that he shot his wife. In the shocked aftermath, no one thought of calling for medical assistance. It's unclear if Lorraine died immediately or if some medical assistance could have saved her life. Leslie then called the police, gave an account of what happened, and then he was taken into custody. The trial began October 1954. It was said that Leslie could not afford his lawyer, which was one of Jamaica's most prominent, so he worked pro bono, meaning free. Because of Leslie's popularity, the case attracted a lot of media attention and crowds would gather outside the courthouse on the days of the trial. If Leslie's defense team could show that he was unreasonably provoked by his wife's actions and behavior and acted without premeditation, then he might get the lesser charge of manslaughter instead of murder. During the trial, his lawyer produced a letter that his wife wrote. It read, My beloved, I'm realizing more than I did before how much I love you. I'm going to force my man's hand as soon as I can. Leslie also provided the court with a vivid reconstruction of the bedroom scene. Leslie was described as having a commanding personality but with a flary temper that got him in trouble with the cricket authorities multiple times during his cricket career. The most damning evidence though was the fact that Lorraine's body had seven bullet wounds. This simply means that Leslie would have had to reload the six shooter, making this act more calculated than just blind rage. Leslie's explanation for this is that he reloaded the gun to commit suicide. However, it still did not explain the seventh bullet wound. The trial ended on October 20th, 1954. Initially, the jury was unable to reach a verdict, but then returned with guilty, adding a recommendation for mercy. However, this recommendation was ignored by the judge and Leslie was sentenced to death by hanging. 
An appeal against the verdict was dismissed on January 1995 by the Supreme Court. On April 21st, his appeal to the Privy Council in London was also denied. And on March 9th, Jamaica's colonial governor rejected a petition for clemency and the execution was set for May 17th. He accepted his fate with dignity and weeks before his execution, he was accepted into the Roman Catholic Church. On the morning of Leslie's last day, he rejected his breakfast. He was wearing a white gown when he was marched out to be hanged. Crowds were gathered outside the St. Catherine District Prison where they held a silent vigil. Leslie George Hilton was hanged on May 17th and his body was buried inside the prison compound. Leslie went down in history as the only cricketer to ever have been hanged. Two years later, after Leslie's hanging, a law was passed whereas the jury could have been more involved in sentencing. So that simply means that if this law was in place while Leslie was being sentenced, he would have been shown mercy. That is all the information that I have on today's case and here are my thoughts. In a setup like that, where the man is at a certain level and the woman is the person that's going out there that's doing big things she's getting herself educated she does not seem like a homebody and she was of a certain social standing from before a man is going to feel less than a man because leslie was still here he had to be with the child he was living in her family home and he was working a regular job. Also, to add strain to the relationship, the mother-in-law did not like him from the jump, and she was the one that he was living with. So to find out, to get a letter to say that your wife is cheating, it is obvious that his ego was bruised. And if anybody has dealt with someone with a bruised ego, especially a male, they are dangerous. We don't know for a fact if she cheated because we're taking this from Leslie. But the truth died with Laureline and the truth died with Leslie. We don't know what happened in the bedroom on that morning. It could have been a case where he confronted her and she simply said, you know what, I'm tired of this. I am leaving. And he got upset. Then whatever happened, happened. Or it could have went the way that he said that he, it went, whereas she admitted to cheating on him and belittled him. And I do believe that she might have belittled him because of the dynamic. Either way, two wrongs don't make a right. If she cheated and he felt as if this was her punishment for cheating, he was in the wrong. Obviously, he got punished for it as well. The true victim in this story, however, was their nine-year-old son. And I really do hope that Laureline's mother did the best job possible at raising that boy. Because that whole situation is crazy to find out that you are motherless and fatherless because of what your father did to your mother and the repercussions of his crimes. I do hope that he grew up to be a very wonderful member of the Jamaican society. Obviously, his name was not published in any of these articles. And even if I did find his name, I wouldn't say his name just for the mere fact that it wasn't easy to find. But anyways, guys, that is it for the video. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, remember to give me a big old thumbs up. As per usual, the links to my sources will be down in my description box below if you have any opinions on this case please leave them in the comment section i love to read them and remember to be a beautiful soul not just a gorgeous face and until my next video pop on a little gloss just a little bit more